So uh, thank you very much. The, the title of this talk is actually do um, chemical reactions have free will? Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I'm actually not going to uh, re uh, resolve real questions about whether things have free will or not because I learned from my supervisor for my MPhil in History and Philosophy of Science, Jeremy Butterfield, who I see right over there, that many of these questions are actually philosophical questions that have been debated for thousands of years and it's unlikely that physicists are going to resolve them. Uh, <coughs> however, what I am going to <coughs> argue today is that I will, I will actually state the results of some rather simple mathematical theorems <coughs> that show that if you are making a decision and chemical reactions do make decisions. For instance, the chemical reactions that govern the metabolism of a cell make decisions to raise or lower amounts of certain chemicals if certain other chemicals are coming in. So if you are making a decision, you have a, some kind of system that's making a decision, and if in addition that system is sufficiently complex to ask the question, what decision will I make? Then it will in general not be able to answer that question. <clears throat> By the way, you don't have to have consciousness or anything like that to have this simple form of self-reference. If you're the operating system for a smartphone, the operating system is a computer program that says it allocates time and space uh, to other programs. So it says, what does program number 17 want, need? And it gives it some time and space. What does program number 743 need? Gives it some time and space. What does program number 42 need? Gives it some time and space. But it itself is program number 42. And if you have that amount of self-reference, you will not be able to predict what you're going to do. So the operating system of your computer can ask the question, what will I do, and will not be able to answer it. So I'm going to argue, actually, that, that the reason for, um, uh, 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 let's, where's my hockey stick? Um, <clears throat> that the reason, the reason for uh, the unpredictability of our actions, at least so far as we're concerned, is not have to do with whether the universe is deterministic or probabilistic, which is the way that the debate has largely been phrased over the last 2,500 years. Um, but in fact, it has to do with the halting problem and uncomputability. It's, it, it's interesting, by the way, it's uh, interesting, I don't know how many people know this, but Turing, prior to coming up with his ideas about the halting problem and to address uh, Gödel's theorem, he was actually studying quantum mechanics. He was reading von Neumann's book, and he was studying quantum mechanics because he actually was interested in the questions of consciousness and free will. All right, so, um, uh, you know, the 2,500 years ago, Epicurus, um, uh, who was an atomist, he had adopted uh, Democritus's theory of atoms, he, uh, he said very famously that the atoms move deterministically but occasionally perform a small swerve called the clinomen. We don't have Epicurus's writing on this, but um, uh, uh, Lucretius has him saying in De Rerum Naturum, Illudin his quoque te rebus cod nostra vemos corra cum de orsum rectum perenane ferrato ponderibus propriis. And it basically says that the atoms fall under their own weights, colliding with each other, but every now and then they have to give a small swerve. Um, otherwise, they just all fall to the ground. That's one reason. But the other reason, which is quite interesting, and this happens about 10 lines later, he says, if they did not give this small swerve, then the thing that we value most about our lives, which is our freedom of will, would not exist. So Epicurus and Lucretius said, we need indeterminacy in order, probabilistic behavior in order to have free will. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, many, uh, two centuries, two millennia later, Newton came up with his laws of notion, and he said that the laws of physics are deterministic. This was very, uh, was so successful that for the subsequent 300 years or so, or 250 years, uh, people had a real problem with free will. So um, if you look at, at uh, 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 philosophers of the of the 18th century, for instance, people like Hume or, or, or Locke, uh, they realized there was a, they said there's a real problem with free will. Uh, Samuel Johnson um, said, all theory is against the freedom of will, all experience for it. Now there's some really, if you dig through the history of this, oh, and by the way, this is, a, if you want to really uh, go into this in, in detail, I have an article in the Proceedings of the Royal Philosophical Society A called A Turing Test for Free Will. It's on the archive as well. You might want to take a look. It has all kinds of more fun quotes and history about this. But there's a lot of entertaining history about this, a lot of interesting firsts, like, for instance, the fact that Turing was actually 
studying quantum mechanics because he was interested in consciousness and free will. But there's a wonderful paper by Maxwell, very little known, but it's actually on free will, and w in which he actually, he actually essentially states that the motions of molecules are chaotic. He says he wants to, to preserve free will. He says, oh, look, when you have hard sphere gas and they're bouncing off of each other, then a little uncertainty will grow and grow and grow and grow. This is a paper from the 1870s that, that uh, anticipates the notion of chaos that Poincaré uh, analyzed 20 years later. Um, now, Eddington, um, when, when the, in the advent of quantum mechanics, which is intrinsically probabilistic, um, uh, 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 people got excited uh, because uh, if you just think that, that free will is all about whether things are probabilistic or deterministic, then if suddenly things are now probabilistic after have, having been deterministic for the previous 300 years, then that's great. And Eddington uh, 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 brought this up, and he, he actually said, you know, now that we have quantum mechanics and its probabilistic nature, and he said, quote, science withdraws its moral opposition to free will. Okay. <laughs> okay, but does randomness actually save free will? Um, actually, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely think no, but I actually have a whole bunch of other, of other uh, well-known philosophers and quantum me mechanicians and people like that, people like Schrodinger, Turing, Hawking, um, Dennett, people, um, you know, it, it's, if you have a randomness, quantum randomness, suppose you make a decision, right, you know, should I have coffee, caffeinated coffee, or decaf? Uh, a decision which I usually have to make around 3 p.m., right? You know, caffeine is more excited, but history means, indicates I won't get as much sleep, right? So which do I do? Now, I can think back and forth, more exciting, safer, more exciting, safer, make a decision. If I can't make a decision, I could flip a coin, right? But adding randomness and flipping a coin is exactly for people who are abdicating their free will. And so the real problem about free will is not really whether it's probabilistic or deterministic, it's whether it's mechanistic. Can a mechanistic system possess free will? A mechanistic system such as the, uh, the set of chemical reactions that underlie the metabolism of a cell. And I will actually show that this is not true. This is just a, a set of mathematical theorems that I will argue. By the way, these theorems have nothing to do with the so-called free will theorems, the Cochrane conway free will theorems. Those theorems actually, in my mind, have nothing to do with free will, not or at least have nothing to do with whether we can predict what we're going to do. It's questions about probabilism in probabilistic nature and quantum mechanics. So I, just in case somebody wants to ask if there's any connection between that, what I'm talking about, the answer is no. So you don't actually have to get up and ask that now. <laughs> all right. So actually, right now, there's an interesting time about free will because you read all kinds of things. Actually, in Stephen Hawking's most recent book, he says he doesn't believe in free will because there's all this evidence from neural, uh, uh, from people putting you know, electrodes into people's brains that they can predict the decisions they're going to make beforehand. Here's my little scientist who's you know, poking at your brain. And uh, you know, the scientist poking at brain can look at the electrodes, the outcomes of the electrodes, and predict the decision you're going to make a split ses session before you're aware of this. And then Hawking says, oh, but this means we don't have free will. Uh, OK, that's fine. If you don't want to say we have free will, that's OK. You still will not be able to predict your own decision. All right. So what I'm actually going to address is a smaller question, but one which I believe is at the essence, which is why we can't predict our own decisions. Now, if you believe we have free will, then this explains free will. If you don't believe we have free will, this, this explains why we have the illusion that we have free will. OK? So what's going on? OK. This is not what's going on. What I'm going to argue is that what's really going on is the halting problem. So here's, this is my, my schematic of the halting problem. This is the head of a Turing machine. It's moving along this Turing machine. It's a universal Turing machine, so it's capable of simulating any other Turing machine, including itself. So, and, um, so here it is. It's simulating, it's asking the question, what am I going to do? So to ask the question what it's going to do, it makes a little model of itself. It starts simulating itself. Of course, but the problem is it's simulating itself asking the question, what am I going to do? So there's more of the model of it simulating itself, what am I going to do? It goes smaller and smaller and smaller until I ran out of resolution in my PowerPoint slide. I hope you like my PowerPoint technique here. <laughs> right. um, and it's this, this capacity for self-reference, which famously leads to the halting problem. Um, uh, if you have systems that have a capacity for self-reference and they're computationally universal, then uh, they cannot predict if they're going to halt. They can't predict if anything's going to halt or not. And in particular, they also won't be able to predict what their decisions are going to be. If their decision is made by some kind of logical process, they won't even know if they're going to make a decision or not. Okay? So a computer which has a uh, sense of self-reference, cannot predict what it's going to do. 
Um, indeed, the halting problem is, you know, it's, uh, you can summarize it in this kind of way. Will I ever be able to answer the question of whether I will be able to answer the question dot, 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 and, you know, now you're in an infinite loop, and now you, you don't know what's going to happen. So this, I claim, is the essence of our inability to predict what we're going to do. We're capable of self-reference. We can ask the question, what will I do? Um, and then you can just prove, you know, if you have a decision-making process, if you say, what will I do? The decision-making process is made in either a deterministic or probabilistic fashion. You will not be able to predict what you're going to do. Uh, and you don't have to be a human being to have this happen. It's also true of the operating system of your smartphone. So if, if it's a, now, now many people, uh, well, the halting problem, of course, you know, it, it really shows up if you have an infinite system with an, inf uh, an infinitely extensible tape, but there is a finite system version of it as well that applies to the kind of finite automata that Jim was talking about as well. Here is somebody, it looks maybe a little bit like uh, Lucille Balls and I Love Lucy because she's got red hair. She's trying to model what she's going to do, what kind of decisions she's going to make. So she makes a model of herself Herself, of course, we have this recursive feature, makes another model of herself, makes another model of herself. If you're a finite system as opposed to an infinite system, you cannot model yourself exactly for the simple reason that you're devoting fewer resources to model yourself than actually you have. You have fewer degrees of freedom in the model than you yourself possess. So as you can see here, the model is kind of more coarse grained and cartoonish and gets more and more cartoonish as it goes further down. And the result is that uh, uh, now even for finite systems, you cannot predict what you're going to do. So uh, if you actually want to, you can go and look at the details of how you prove this, you, you can prove that simulating oneself is either slower or less detailed or chancier than just being yourself, okay? There's a bunch of different trade-offs, but you, there's always a trade-off. You can't get away, you cannot simulate yourself exactly in the same amount of time it takes for you to be yourself. Um, and the, by the way, the finite time, finite system version of this is called the hartmann stearns theorem. This is a theorem from the, the, the good old days of computational complexity before the polynomial hierarchy. Um, uh, it basically says, to predict with certainty what you will decide to do an hour from now takes more than an hour. So there's two ways of actually deciding. You can either just like go through the thought process you have to do to make the decision and make the decision. I think, what the hell, I'll have caffeine. You know, <laughs> right? Or you can try to make the decision in the following way. You can ask, what am I going to do? What decision will I make? Well, how will I make this decision? Here's the person trying to think of do it the second way. How will I make this decision? Here's the person just making the decision. hartmann stern theorem says that if I have a system whose t temporal resources are limited to t, so it has to come up with an answer after time t, so it's a finite automaton that's only going to run for time t, then indeed you can predict what it's going to do, but to predict what it's going to do takes time t squared. This is what the Harmonistern theorem says. It's rather nice. It's just, it's simply the finite system version of the Cantor diagonalization argument that goes into uh, proving the halting problem. It's the finite system version of the halting problem. Something that if you, you're, you're just going to do it in time t, if you're going to ask yourself the question, what, how, what am I going to do in time t, answering that question takes in general time t squared. Okay? It just takes longer. That's just the way it is. So um, I invite you to think about this next time you're making a decision. I understand that, that there, there's a, a very long thousands, uh, multiple millennia old prejudice on part of many people and on often particularly scientists that says, oh, it's just about free question of free will, but whether we can predict what we're going to do is a question about whether the laws of physic are, physics are deterministic or whether they're probabilistic. I claim that this actually just doesn't have anything to do with it. Our inability to ask the, to, uh, to predict what we're going to do, this, this explanation, this feature that you can't predict what you're going to do, has nothing to do whether the universe is deterministic or probabilistic. You could have a, a, uh, an automaton that's a, a, a deterministic automaton or a probabilistic automaton. It won't be able to answer the question of what it's going to do in general, what decision it's going to make. Um, it's true whether the universe is classical or whether it's quantum mechanical. Again, it doesn't matter. This is like, you know, the, the, the quantum computers have the same problem as classical computers. They also will not be able to predict what decision they're going to make. Um, so indeed, so as this, the, title, the title of the paper, A Turing Test for Free Will, uh, says, 
I, I suggest in this paper, I suggest we could this in a kind of whimsical fashion. We should have a, a self-administered Turing test for free will. I mean, it's self-administered because um, unlike the ordinary Turing test where it's an adversarial thing, it's like, you know, if you cheat on your self-administered test about whether you have free will, then you have only yourself to blame, right? <laughs> There's no real point in cheating. So, so suppose you're sufficiently complicated as an information processing system to answer the following questions. So am I a decider? Like George H.W. Bush famously saying, I am the decider, right? He decided he was the decider. So is there a decision to be made? So like, for example, I think I encourage you to think of this decision that the operating system of a computer is going to make. The operating system is going to allocate resources to other programs is deciding how to allocate those resources. It's just an algorithm in your computer that's doing it, but it is deciding how to do it. Nobody else is deciding how to allocate those resources. Can I model my behavior and that of others? This is also true of the operating system of a computer. It has to have a model of the, of the programs that it's allocating resources to, and it has to have a model of itself in order to allocate those resources. These models, of course, will always be incomplete. And then you ask the question, can I predict my own decisions? And if you answered yes to question one and yes to question two truthfully, then the only truthful answer to question three is no. So if you answered yes to one, yes to two, and you answered yes to three, then you're cheating and you only have yourself to blame because you're only just fooling yourself. This is just not, you know, this has nothing to do with determinism or, 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 or probability or chanciness. It just has to do with processing information and with, by systems that actually have a very rudimentary notion of self-reference, like the operating system of the computer, program number 42, that asks the question, what will program number 42 do? That's enough of the notion of self-reference. So you don't necessarily need to be conscious. I don't believe the operating system of my computer is conscious. Malevolent, yes. Conscious, no. <laughs> okay, so who's gonna pass this? A thermostat, very simplest kind of finite automata with input-output relations, no. It doesn't, it can't compute its way out of a paper bag. It doesn't have enough computational power to ask the question, you know, what will I do? Are pets? Maybe. People who have pets assign them superhuman consciousness and free will and all those other things. We don't know. The things like trees or bacteria, probably not. Probably not. Once you get to human beings or, or, or systems that have immune systems whose job is actually to ask questions, you know, is this part of me or is this not part of me? then you're starting to get in trouble. In fact, uh, this same argument, I'm trying, working on a paper to apply this to autoimmune diseases, it essentially says autoimmune diseases are inescapable because they involve this problem of self-reference and a finite information processing system. And that problem of self-reference can never actually be answered correctly 100% of the time for just the same reasons that you can't predict what you're going to do. However, if you look at your computer or your smartphone, the answer is yes. Right? They have the ability to model themselves. They are deciders. They have the ability to model themselves. They can ask the question, what do I need and what am I going to do? And they will not be able to answer that question. So your operating system of your computer cannot predict what it's going to do. Does it have free will? I don't know. I'm not, you could even ask it if it's going to, if it knows what it's going to do, because that's a, it's a program. You could ask it, what are you going to do? It will say, I'm too busy allocating this memory resources to answer your stupid question, go away. And I don't know the answer, right? So you could even ask it, it would not be able to answer. So, uh, yeah, so here's, here's where we are, somewhere out on the edge of the spiral galaxy. There's a black hole going, this is here's somebody falling into a black hole. I just wanted to, to pay homage to everything that's going on here. And actually, the first time I gave this talk uh, was the first time I had a smartphone, actually, and I asked Siri. This is the first time I'd ever used Siri. I asked, said, so Siri, do you want to go out for a beer after this talk? And do you know what Siri said? Siri said, this is about you, Seth, not about me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>